Good morning again. Week three in our series, Witness. How to be a witness. How to be able to tell people, hey, come and see, and then go and tell. And through this series, we've been looking at, you know, we spent two weeks looking at Paul and Silas. And today we're going to look at a piece of scripture that is very well known both inside the church and outside the church. And many of you, when I tell you we're going to be looking at the story of the prodigal son, are going to be going, man, pastor, you know how many messages I've heard about the prodigal son? Well, you know how many messages I've heard about the prodigal son? (laughs) But today, I'm going to preach on the prodigal son on an angle that probably no one has ever heard preached on or that you've even ever really thought about. Because we all know about the father, we know about the prodigal son, and we know about the good son. But there's others in this story that we generally miss. And and that's who we're going to be looking at today. But before we get started, um, have you ever felt when you're serving that, you know, sometimes when you serve you feel kind of insignificant? You know, or, or, or you kind of feel like what you're doing really doesn't matter. You know, and, and I felt the same way in my life. And, and not only inside the church, you know, you, you're serving inside the church, you're trying to do things, or, or even outside the church when you're serving and you're helping others and you don't even get a thank you. They don't even, oh, well, thank you very much. Or you don't even get this, can I assist you in this? And me, generally, when I'm serving someone or I'm doing this task and, and because no one else will do it and you know, all of a sudden no one's saying, hey, thank you, I kind of get, why am I wasting my time? And, and then what happens when you get to that point is, is you kind of you stop doing it. You're like, well, it must be that insignificant that no one notices it, so I'll just stop doing it. And then how many things go to the wayside because people who were serving stopped doing it because they felt insignificant? And think about it in your own life. Have you ever felt that way where, where you're doing something? One of my own pet peeves is if I open a door for somebody and they just walk through the door and say nothing at all, <laughs> I'm very quick to say, well, you're welcome Yeah, exactly. You know, and and that's serving. You're serving someone, and they give you no nothing for doing it. Almost like it's expected. And and, and as a servant, you know, we're not supposed to be looking for accolades and this and that. But it's nice to hear it, isn't it? It's nice to hear thank you. It's nice to hear other things. And, And you know, and I got to thinking about this if. If we feel insignificant when we're serving someone, do you think sometimes when people come inside a church that they feel insignificant? The first time coming in that, you know, do do these people really care if I'm here? Does it really matter that I came into the church? And, And you'll hear a lot of churches say, oh, but we're a friendly church. Are you really friendly? Think, yes, okay, think about this. So you're really friendly, so maybe someone new comes into the church and, and you walk up to them and you're like, oh, hi, how are you doing? You pass a little pleasantries, and that's it. Do you talk to them the next week? Do you talk to them the week after that? You see, a lot of times when we're friendly, we're friendly with someone to find out if they fit in. Are they going to be significant enough to be part of our group? And see, I believe that a welcoming church is better than a friendly church because when you welcome somebody in, you accept them the way they are and you would generally invite them in to be part of the family. And instead of someone feeling insignificant, they're welcomed. And there is a difference. You know, a lot of times being friendly is very superficial. It's either what can I get out of them or are they going to fit in? But yet when you welcome someone, you're opening up your doors to them, you let them in, they become part of the family. 
And, and I think a lot of times that, you know, we find the same thing in life. You find people who will call themselves, well, I'm a Christian. Uh, well, I'm a Christian. And I think there's a big difference between being a difference. There's a difference between being a Christian and a Christ follower. And I think the difference between being a Christian and a Christ follower is this. Christians are normally consumers. Typically, Christians are consumers. Christ followers are servants. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, so you're going to understand a little bit more about the difference between being a Christ follower and being a Christian. And I think that we got to understand that, that when we serve Jesus... When we take our gifts, we take our talents and, and that he has given us and we serve him with our gifts and our talents, we're able to see lives changed. We can see lives changed and we can create this huge ripple effect just by being a servant of Jesus Christ, not just a Christian. And, and yes, Christian is associated with Christ's follower. No doubt, Christian is, but how easy is it for someone to say, I'm a Christian? In today's world, pretty easy. We, there are denominations out there that you can simply say, that's a cult, and the world calls them Christians. So there is a difference between a Christian and a Christ follower. Yes, in, in the Bible, they are considered the same, that Christ followers, followers of the way, were Christians. But I think that when we look at this story, you're going to see the difference between a typical Christian and a Christ-following Christian, if that makes better sense. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the back of the pew, but as always, it will be on the screen. And with that being said, hey, let's welcome those who joined us for Church Online today. Hey. Thank you for joining us on Church Online. Uh, the scripture will also be on the screen for you guys. But if you joined us via epiclantana.com slash live, if you look on the right side, there's a thing that says notes and there's also a Bible. You can click on that and follow along with us. But hey, we're glad you're here, but don't let it replace you being connected to a local church. You know, being connected with a local church is where we're able to work on our relationship with Jesus and with others. So we thank you for joining us for Church Online, but make sure you get connected. So with that being said, Luke 15, verses 11 through 24. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word this morning, Lord, we ask that you speak to us through your word. Lord, that you will open our eyes to see what it is you want us to see. 
And Lord, may your words be mine and may your name be glorified. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this parable that Jesus is sharing, the servants, the father's hired hands, have this huge role. But, but you think about it, whenever you hear a sermon on this, you don't hear about the servants. People don't talk about the servants. And understand the theologians, most theologians say the servants in this story are Christ followers. They are Christ followers. So the servants are huge inside this story, and most people miss it. And like I said, understand anyone can call themselves a Christian, but in a lot of cases, Christians are nothing but consumers. They consume everything. And you think about this, James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. So if we have faith in Jesus, we should have some type of works. Now, works will not get us into heaven. But God requires us as Christ followers to have an active faith. We, we should be active. We should be moving. We shouldn't be collecting dust. We should be moving so that dust don't have time to settle. But a lot of times as Christ followers, we kind of get to that point of, you know, well, I've done my part. I'm good enough. I did my part. Well, we should always be moving. We should always be people of action, moving because that's what God calls us to be. You know, many people call themselves Christians, and they're like them people that come over for Thanksgiving dinner. You know, they, they come over for Thanksgiving dinner, and they don't bring any side dishes. They just come, and they bring their Tupperware to take food with them, you know, and, and they don't contribute at all to the meal, but yet they'll complain that you didn't make something. You see, they're consumers. They're, they're consumers, and a lot of Christians are like that. You think about it, there's a lot of Christians who just show up and, and don't bring anything to the table, but then complain. But then they want something to take with them and leave with them when they're gone. And you're thinking about it, you're going, really? It doesn't make sense. And, and, you know, if we don't do anything at all, if we just are consumers, are we really doing what God called us to do? In, in Ephesians 5.1, it tells us, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Even Jesus said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to be served and give his life as a ransom. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. If we are followers of Jesus, we should be serving people, not looking to be served. But yet some of us, like I said, are like them people at the Thanksgiving meal. And, and, you know, if we're going to actually imitate God and imitate Jesus, we should be servants. We should be willing to do what God calls us to do, shake off the dust and continue to move forward. And I think in this story of the prodigal son is if you actually read the story and you look at the hired hands, you look at the servants in this story, you're going to see their part is huge. What they do is very huge in this story, and so many times we've missed it. We, we've totally missed what the servants have done and what, they've, what their witness meant inside this story. And, and you look at it like this. The, the first thing we're going to see is the servants had influence. The servants had influence over the son. In, in verses 14 through 17, it says this. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill of the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, so when he finally realized, hey, wait, something's not right here, what's it say? How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying from hunger. He realizes he's lost his identity. It says he's come to his senses, so he's lost his identity. And understand, in Jewish tradition, identity came from two things. 
A person's identity came from God and their family. And even today, a lot of us, that's where our identity comes from, God and family. Now, we'll add all these other identities of my job or this or that, but ultimately, our identity should come from two things, God and family. He literally says, I need to tell my father I have sinned against you in heaven because he's lost his identity. He lost who he was as a son, as a Jewish man. He's lost his identity. And think about who Jesus is telling this parable to. He's telling this parable to Pharisees and tax collectors. So he's telling it to people who are very detailed and law oriented. They know the law, they're very detail oriented, and he's telling of a Jewish boy feeding pigs. Makes no sense. And you think about anyone, any Jewish person back in, the, in that time would have never stooped so low as to feed pigs. Remember, pigs were unclean animals. They are unclean animals to the Jew. They would never have gotten that low where they're going to feed the pigs and then wish they had the food that the pigs were getting. They would never stoop that low. Now, this isn't about losing our identity. That's not what this is about. But we got to understand that a lot of times we, as Christ followers, lose our identity. We lose focus on what God's called us to do. We lose that influence. We see the servants had an influence. They had this influence over this young man. And a lot of times we lose our influence. We lose it because life gets in the way. <clears throat> life got in the way of the young man. And he lost, he, he lost his identity in what he was doing. But I think when you actually look at verse 17, after he came to his senses, the first person he thought about was the servants. How much food does the hired hands of my father have? He remembered the servants. So if he remembered the servants, there had to be something more about them than just knowing that they had food. You think about it, if they were the servants, they would have served him also. So he had to be thinking about their hearts. He had to be thinking about <clears throat> the actions that they, the way they lived their life. And even their faithfulness to not only the father, but the son. So, so as they looked at this and understanding, the servants probably never realized the influence they had over the son because they were going about serving and doing what the father called them to do. But yet the son, in his time of despair, remembered the servants. He remembered who they were. He remembered their heart. He remembered things about them, and he remembered what the servants had. The servants had something that he did not have. And understand, if you're being a servant, you have that same godly influence over others. People in your life are looking to you, and you have that same type of influence in their life. And even though you may not realize it, you have influence over their life. Because when bad times come, who are they going to look to? They're going to look to you. This week, when these people dealing with the loss of a loved one didn't have a relationship with anyone, but they knew there was a God and wanted to talk to somebody. They wanted to talk to someone who was serving God to be with them during that time. You know, we, we talked last week about who's listening to you. When you say that you're a Christian, you say that you're a Christ follower, people are watching what you do. They're listening to the way that you talk. They're watching the way you walk. And they're watching how you interact with others. And when times get tough, what you do compared to everybody else. So you have influence over people in your life. You have influence over them that you probably don't even realize you have. But each one of us has influence. And if you proclaim to be a Christian, people are going to be watching you. And you do have influence over them. 
And remember, as Matthew, in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, it says, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. A city on a hilltop cannot be hidden. You know, the whole, no one puts their light under a basket. If we're the light of the world, <clears throat> people should see us, and it means we're going to have influence over others. Unfortunately, some of us are taking that light, and we're like hiding it. We're putting it in our pocket. We're hiding it under a lampshade. We don't want people to see it. We should shine a light every place we go because the influence we have means so much. Don't ever think you don't have influence over other people. You have influence over other people, and because they know you, they, they've seen you, they watch you walk, they walk the talk, you, you do what you're called to do, you have influence when you walk up and then you invite them. Hey, let me tell you about what Jesus did in my life. Let me tell you what, come and see what he's done in my life so then you can go and tell people what he's done in yours. You have that power of influence over other people because of being a Christ follower. Don't just be a Christian and be a consumer. If you're a Christ follower, you have influence because you're serving. And because of that servant's heart, they're going to remember your heart. They're going to remember your actions. And when you come to talk to them, guess what? They're going to listen and remember you. They're going to remember you in their time of troubles, and they're going to come to you because you have influence. I think the second thing we see in verse 17 is the servants had an abundance. The, the servants had an abundance. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying hungry. In the Greek, there's more than enough food. Actually refers to they had this abundance. They were overflowing with food. They were overflowing with this abundance from God, from the Father. And, and when they looked at it, you can say that the, the servants were well taken care of. They were very well taken care of. And understand, this is during biblical times. Servants didn't have much. Servants didn't have a lot. They weren't expected to have a lot. They required on their master to provide for their needs. They, they provided for them, and that's exactly what we see is their master, the father, provided well for them that they had in abundance. And if Jesus is our master, we need to understand that Jesus will supply all of our needs. Each one of us has an abundance. You see, the problem is most of us don't know we have an abundance, but each one of us has an abundance. Jesus takes care of us. And, and you may be sitting in here saying, Pastor, no, I don't. Well, yeah, you do. I guarantee you have an abundance of love to give to others. Each one of us has love. You probably have enough love to give to others. The problem is maybe you just don't give it. Maybe you hold on to it. I'm going to save it for a rainy day. Each one of us has a talent. Each one of us has a talent to give. We have an abundance of it. Each one of us, believe it or not, you have an abundance of time. Now, I know some of you go, oh, no, I don't. I bet you do. If you managed your time, you'd probably have more time than you think you have. The problem is we don't manage time. We let time manage us instead. But if we manage that time, and some people won't give because they say, Pastor, why well, I don't have enough. I guarantee you have more of an abundance than what you think you have. And all it does is take that, that time to actually look at it. Steward what you have. Yeah, guarantee if you look at your checkbook, your checkbook tells you what you're, what you're taking your time on. If you see a whole bunch of Starbucks on there or Dunkin' Donuts or a whole bunch of restaurants, and then you're saying, I can't, I, yeah, pizza, pizza palace. If all of a sudden you say, man, I can't pay my bills, and you start looking and saying, well, man, I spent $40 this month at Starbucks. Man, I spent $50 at Dunkin' Donuts. Man, I, I spent $200 eating out instead of going and getting groceries and eating in. 
If we honestly took the time and, and looked at what God provided for us and managed it, we wouldn't have pressure paying our bills. We wouldn't have pressures in life because he's going to supply all of our needs. The problem is we want him to supply our wants also. And I think if we took care of the needs that, that God's going to take care of our needs, that each one of us would have an abundance. <clears throat> we would have an abundance. And I think a lot of times it's just because we don't step out in faith. We don't step out in faith. We don't manage what God's given us. And then we say, well, I don't have anything. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will supply all all your needs according to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. He will supply it. We have to be good stewards of what God supplies. Remember, the servants had an abundance. They had an overflow of food. Their needs were met by the Father and they had an abundance. Why? Because they managed it, they took care of what was given to them by their father. We need to do the same in our life because we do have an abundance. And I think the next thing we see is, is because they served, because they served, life change happened. Now, now think about this. He came to his senses and he remembered the servants. After he remembered the servants, it says this in verse 22 through 24. Well, a after he came back to the father, he came to his sense, come back to his father. Father, forgive me. The fa they say this. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals in his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Because of the servant's influence, because of the servant's abundance, life change happened. This son of mine was dead and now he's saved. Because of their influence, because of their abundance, because they were servants, life changed. Someone who was dead is now alive. And they're throwing a party for him. The Bible says when someone who is lost accepts Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, the angels celebrate in heaven. There is a party in heaven because a servant here on earth had influence, had abundance, and because of that, someone's life changed and there was a party. A party not only here on earth for someone accepting Jesus, but a party in heaven. In this story, we see the servants are the ones who are called to throw the party. The servants are the ones to bring the people together and to serve. Church will not happen without people who serve. What we do here on a Sunday, what we do here during the week, when we hand out food or we open up the clothes closet when we give to Annie Armstrong when we give to any type of outreach would not happen without people who serve I want to let you know you have a gift you have a talent God expects you to use it God expects you to use your gift or your talent you have time God wants you to steward it you have treasures he wants you to steward your treasures None of this can happen without servants, without Christ followers doing what God has called them to do. Without doing what God has called him to do, us to do. We can't just sit back and wait. You can't expect the other person to do it. Are you a Christian who is a consumer? I'm just coming in to be fed and I'm leaving. Or you're a Christ follower that is making a change that has influence out there in the world. You have influence in your home. You have influence in your workplace. 
every place you go, that people know you're a Christ follower, you have an influence. And you have an abundance that some of you probably don't even realize you have because you don't steward it. Take the steps that God calls you to do and be obedient. Be obedient to what God calls you to do and serve. Take the time to serve. Serve inside the church. Serve outside the church. Be who God calls you to be. Because a servant can ultimately change lives. And don't we want to see lives change? And, you know, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I can't not look at this story and not look at the good son. You know, the good son... In verses 25 through 32, it says, Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So they weren't Baptist. So he summoned one of his servants, questioning what, things, what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him? Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, unfortunately, many of us can be just like that. Maybe not the whole jealousy part of it. Some of us maybe. You know, with this legalistic, well, we've been here. And you don't want to come inside for the party. Many of us don't want to step inside for the party. We would rather stay on the outside, be a legalist, wife, I, 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 instead of he, 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 he. As servants, we can affect life change and bring people to a party and let the heavens rejoice because we did what we wanted, what we're called to do. Or we could refuse to come to the party and just be a consumer. You know, one of them Christians that comes to church and never, never serves, never gives, basically does nothing at all, except as I've talked about the last couple of weeks, warms a pew for an hour and 15 minutes. Be more than a pew warmer. You have influence. Make a difference in someone's life this week. Be an influencer in someone's life. Go out there and make a difference. Because i got to ask you, are you a Christian or are you a Christ follower? And many of you earlier were, oh, I'm a Christian. Now you're going, oh, am I a consumer? Am I that person who comes to Thanksgiving dinner and just eats? Alfredo, and brings Tupperware, Alfredo. But think about that. You may be going to a Thanksgiving dinner, and you may have the best recipe for fried turkey. And you're not even going to take time to fry that turkey and bring it with you. You're just going to come and consume what's already there. Some of y'all got a great witness. Some of y'all do a lot of inviting. Some of y'all have influence and are doing nothing with it. Making no change in the life of the people around you. You're coming to church, you're playing Christian. I did my part and you're going back out that door. And then you, besides the hour and 15 minutes you're here, you're just like the world. You're a consumer instead of a Christ follower making a difference in someone's life. Each one of us can affect life change. 
So are you a Christian or are you a Christ follower? Are you truly a servant? We're on a mission. We're on a mission. We're a bunch of imperfect, messed up, jacked up people who are chasing a real Jesus. We're chasing a real Jesus, and we need to bring people with us. 85% of this county of South Florida alone are not connected to a local church. Think about that, 85%. So how many of your neighbors aren't connected to a local church and don't know Jesus? How many of your coworkers aren't connected to a local church or know Jesus? How many people do you know who are still in fear from the pandemic and not going to church, but they'll go to Publix? Or they'll go to Home Depot or they'll go out to dinner. And the worst, they'll go to Golden Corral and get something to eat and they won't come into church because of fear. We've got people out there right now who, who still have fear. They have no joy. They have no peace. They have none of this. They see what's happening with gas prices. They see what's happening with the economy. In the Ukraine, they see what's happening. They think, oh, World War III is coming. They've got no peace. They've got no hope. But we know a person that can bring them hope, love, peace, and joy. Tell them about you, Jesus. Tell them about what Jesus has done in your life and be that influencer God's called you to be. Every one of us, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, inside school you have influence over people. Don't let them influence you, influence them. Be the influencer that God's called you to be. Don't be like the world. Be the change. Be the change and make the world a better place because that's what we all want. We all want the world to be a better place, and we can affect that change simply by serving others, by serving others. Take the influence you have. Invite people to church. Tell people your story and share your faith with others. Be open and obedient to what God calls you to be and see how much more God will bless you for being his servant instead of being a consumer. There's a difference between Christians and Christ followers. Christians are typically consumers. Christ followers are servants. And when you serve Jesus with the gifts and talents he's given you, Life can change, and there's a huge ripple effect. You may never see the entire ripple effect just by your influence over one person could change an entire family, an entire community with one simple person you talk to. Be the change God has called you to be. Be the person and the servant God called you to be. And if you don't know who Jesus is, the first act of servant you need to be is accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. Like I said, we're all messed up. We're jacked up. We are imperfect people chasing a a real imperfect God. And God's word says we're all sinners. We all fall short of glory of God. So you're not alone. You're not alone in being a sinner. Everyone in here sins, including me. Our sins are just different than the way it used to be. But God's word also says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then become that Christ follower that God called you to be. And maybe you're here and you, well, you know, Pastor, I, I, I've been that Christian. I've been that consumer. You know, I I come to church and I just keep my spot warm. You know, this is my spot. No one's allowed to sit in my spot. This is my spot every weekend. Meanwhile, your Bible's getting dusty. And people in your life see you as one of those Christians who consumes things instead of a Christ follower who serves other and has influence and has an abundance. And if you're that person who's been a consumer, maybe it's time to just come up here and say, Lord, 
I need to rededicate my life to you and I need to do what you've called me to do. And, and you can come up here, you can do it right where you're at. Be the influencer God called you to be. Make a change in your family. The change starts with you. It starts with you by looking in your heart and asking that question, am I a consumer or a servant? And if you're truly not a servant, you need to get that heart change because you can serve anywhere you're at. But understand, we can't do what we do here if people don't serve. It takes a community of believers coming together to be a movement of God. So let's come together and be that movement of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, I raise up this congregation to you today, Lord. Lord, and, and sometimes it's heavy when, when we walk around. Lord, we're a Christian. And we're a Christian as the world sees us. Instead of the Christian, the followers of the way, a Christ follower that we see in your word. Lord, may we be the servants that that those who are hurting will come and see us, that they will see the abundance that you have supplied in our life. And Lord, that we will be good stewards of everything you provide for us. And Lord, that we will make a change, not only in our lives, but in the people we come in contact with. And Lord, if there's anyone here, whether in the room or joining us for church online that don't know you, Lord, I ask that you touch them with the Holy Spirit that they will make that move today. Because today is the day of salvation. That they will accept you, move forward, and be a servant for you. And Lord, for those who have fallen into being a consumer, and show no works inside their faith, Lord. Works won't get us to heaven, but you require action from us that they will begin to move again and catch that fire the first day they accepted you as their Savior. And Lord, we love you, we honor you, we praise you, Lord. Lord, we make this prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us here today at FBC Lantana for Church Online. And, and, and if, if you enjoyed what you saw today, I'd just like to ask you to go ahead, go to our website and, and help support this ministry as we try and outreach and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And you can just go to our website, fbclantana.com slash give, um, and you can make an online donation right there. Again, I encourage you to get connected to a local church, and especially if during this message you felt compelled to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, definitely go tell somebody. Let someone know because that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And, and from there, get connected to a local church. Hey, we would love to provide you with some resources with that. You can go to our website, fbclantana.com, and on the very front page, you say, give my life to Jesus. Click on there, and at the bottom of there, there's some links and some good information for you. And just wanted to say, welcome to the family.